Welcome everyone to the latest webinar from Hired Power. We are here today to talk about creating connection between incarceration and community. So I'm very excited to welcome Harold Owen and Deidre Fitzpatrick from Hired Power, as well as JL Guitar Doors USA's Wayne Kramer for an in-depth conversation on drug addiction, incarceration, and the many ways that Hired Power can help. America's jail population is growing rapidly with the highest incarceration rate worldwide, which is why we are dedicating to serve, we are dedicated to serving the incarcerated and offering many services for their use. In today's webinar, we'll share more about our services for the community, including writing alternative, alternative sentencing letters and offering monitoring, safe passage, and case management services to support the defendant when released from jail or when coming up to their release date. And we will also get to hear more about Wayne Kramer's story and his work his organi organization is doing to bring hope to prison inmates through music. So very excited to have our speakers here today. If you guys want to unmute yourselves, I will start the introduction. So first, the person thinking uh, with an awesome hat on, Deidre, is unmuting us right now. So Deidre Fitzpatrick, serves as our Hired Power COO. She brings with her a bachelor's degree in child and adolescent development and a master's degree in nursing leadership and education. She has been in the field of addiction and behavioral health for seven years now, more than that. And here at Hired Power, she works closely with the leadership team to continue to grow and develop our services through her skills and knowledge of addiction and mental health from a nursing perspective. Second, we have Harold Owen. Welcome, Harold. He is our clinical liaison at Hired Power, and he brings with him 32 years of experience specializing in the field of addiction treatment from the entertainment, legal, and medical communities. He formerly worked with the Music Cares Foundation as senior director, so has a lot in common with Wayne. And um, he is a frequent moderator and panelist at a number of music and entertainment industry conferences and addresses the problems of addiction and has twice received official certificates of, um, from the mayor for outstanding service to the city of Los Angeles and the field of autism recovery. So welcome, Harold. And last but definitely not least, we're very excited to introduce you to our guest speaker today, Wayne Kramer. He is the executive director at Jail Guitar Doors USA. Um, they are a Los Angeles-based nonprofit organization that provides instruments for adult and youth prisoners to help them in their rehabilitation. Prior to his work with Jail Guitar Doors, he was a songwriter for film and television, as well as one of the world's most um, incredible guitarists. He came to prominence in 1968 as the founder of Detroit's pioneering M MC5. And among his many notable accomplishments in the music industry, he also co-wrote the acclaimed R&B musical, The Last Words of Dutch Schultz, which, and he was the original guitarist in Don Was Revolutionary Acid Funk Band. And last but not least, he wrote the incredible free jazz album, Lexington, that landed on the Billboard's Jazz Chart Top 10. So welcome, welcome, and thank you so much to our speakers, and I look forward and hand it off to you. Thank you, thank you, Emily. Harold Owens here. I am really excited to be with two dear friends. Just to full disclosure, Wayne and I have known each other 30 years. And Deidre and I have worked together for the past year at Higher Power. I'm honored to be with both of you guys. And, um, you know, Deidre, we were, we were talking. I, I had no idea about your background with, with criminal justice. And so I have uh, this long-standing relationship with Wayne and your activism throughout the years, but particularly with jailhouse doors. And I, I was wondering, I was, I, I want to ask you, you know, what got you kind of to this point in your, in your life that now you are really, after having gone through the, the system uh, in the 70s, what got you here? I mean, what's your story? Yeah, I think it's very compelling. Um, well, it's no secret I served a federal prison term in the 1970s. And uh, upon release, I started tracking what was going on in the world of corrections in America. Uh, I was interested in it. 
And I started to follow reports of prison populations going up. When I went to prison, there were 350,000 people in prison in America, state and federal. There's about 50,000 people in the federal system, 300,000 in the various state systems. Um, and I watched as populations rose year in, year out, decade in, decade out, first tens of thousands, then hundreds of thousands as the war on drugs ratcheted up to today where we have 2.3 million of our fellow citizens um, in custody, incarcerated. We lock up more people in America than any country in the history of the world. Yeah. And that, you, you, know what, you know what frightens me is that it's almost like the Gulag system in Russia that they, they send these people away and they you don't hear from them forever. This is a new, you know, this is a new area for me of understanding because I've got a few clients incarcerated, but it's like that population is we we, we ghosted them. We ghosted them. Yeah. Exactly. And and the, the, the really one of the damaging aspects of this is that uh, most white Americans, although they would have a great opinion about criminal justice and prison, they really don't know what they're talking about. They're really ill-informed. Uh, communities of color and limited economic means know a lot about prison. They, are, uh, they know cousins and uncles and fathers and mothers and children that are serving time, that are in and out of the system. Um, and it made me angry. I, I got mad, I got pissed off. I said, when is somebody gonna say something about this? Or when is somebody gonna do something about this? And, you know, I, I, I came to the conclusion that I can't do everything, but I can do something. And that one person can make a difference and a group of people working together can make a huge difference. And I thought, well, what could I do? Um, I'm a musician, I'm an ex-convict, um, I'm politically conscious. And you have a bandwidth because the name for your organization came from, from who? I mean, can, well, can... the great, the great uh, Billy Bragg um, wanted to create an independent initiative in the United Kingdom to provide instruments for to, as tools for rehabilitation in um, Her Majesty's prisons. And he wanted to honor the life's work of the Clash's leader, Joe Strummer. He admired Joe a great deal. And uh, so he decided to name the organization Jail Guitar Doors, which was a song the Clash wrote. It was an old B-side um, about me. Yeah, that's <laughs> and, it. And a couple other musicians who were all having um, serious challenges with authority. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I took, the, I happened to put on a concert at Sing Sing in New York, the infamous maximum security facility. And I took a bunch of my musician friends with me. And one of them was Billy Bragg. And, and I saw that he had jail guitar doors written on his guitar. Mm -hmm. And I said, how did that get there? What does that mean? And he said, oh, it's an old Clash B-side. Have you ever heard it? And I said, heard it? <laughs> really, the song is about me. Yeah. What, 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 what? Yeah. Bloody up and hell. He had forgotten the, you know, as he reviewed the lyric that, uh, that they wrote it about me. They were MC5 fans. The MC5 was my um, hard rock band from Detroit. Uh, started in the 60s. And um, I didn't think much of it after I was released. I heard about the song and thought it was a great display of solidarity between musicians. These guys are in England. I didn't know them. And they wrote the song and I was honored and humbled. Um, but I, I didn't think any more of it until Billy told me that what he was doing in England. And 
it was exactly what I was looking for. I was looking for a vehicle yeah. to pour my energy into that could make a difference in the justice system in this country. That was the genesis. Yeah, that was that was, was born in that moment. Yeah, yeah. He said, I said, I want to take this on. I'm, you do this in England, it's good, you're British, but I'm an American yeah. and I'm an American musician and I'm an American ex-convict. And uh, he said, good, because I was just about to task you with it. Yeah. Because you know the system. But those moments when you get those moments of inspiration, when they hit you, they, they hit me. I know it feels like, oh, this is my path. And this is where this is it. And, and I really, yeah. I, I want to ask you, because uh, I had no idea about your family history. And what was your kind of like Wayne's entry into this this system uh, of discovery? What was your experience with? Yeah. So, um, well, one we have personal experience of having family in um, the prison system. So I've had a biological brother incarcerated, and working with um, public defenders is always a great time. And um, the easiest thing you've ever done. You don't need any support. Joke, joke, joke. When you're going through that. Um, and then having an uncle who was also incarcerated for a long period of time and seeing that family dynamic and the criminalization of even the visitors that come to visit the, their loved ones while they're in that. What, what do you mean by that? So I would say the, you know, having a, a child who goes to visit their father and their father can't hug their child because um, that's the way that the rules are for visiting. Um, and so this little two-year-old girl who has no idea why, why, here's my dad right next to me and I can't hug him for him. No, I was not too. Right. This was a cousin of mine. Yeah. So not being able to hug him and then having, seeing it from that perspective and then seeing it as an adult supporting my brother from that perspective of mm -hmm. trying to get money to him, trying to get letters and stamps to him. Now, you know, you don't do letters and stamps, you use JPay or something like that. So you need to have, be able to have a cell phone or access to internet to be able to communicate with somebody. Um, and then, you know, where that dynamic is, is you put money in someone's account and then all of a sudden it's gone because they have to pay to commissary or they have to pay to their daily rate to be it's incarcerated. And so you don't see all of that and there's no communication. And so it's so hard. You're so isolated from the inside and the family member can feel totally lost and, and, and also feel like the criminal when you make a phone call and they speak to you like you've done all these wrong things. And you're like, all I'm trying to do is get stamps and a piece of paper to my loved one so we can communicate, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that that piece was so big. And then, you know, having a mom who went in and out of that system and then going myself and being um, in an Orangewood children's shelter and what that looked like as a children's shelter where they treated the children, you know, like their own criminal, right? White t-shirts with your last names on them with blue jeans and you have to eat at this time and you go to bed at this time and you have to be very regimented when you're there because the justice system has put you there, whether it's for the best or for the worst. Well, you know, uh, you... <laughs> well, let's throw something at you, okay? okay. Wayne, hear me out. We, um, you know, Deidre has such great credentials and has, you know, uh, an RN, and I, I was trying to see, we'll talk about this later, because maybe we can enlist Deidre and, and some of the population that you work with, maybe when they get out, you know, and uh, I'm a big believer in giving back, you know, and maybe uh, Deidre, that would be awesome. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, I love it. We have a place for you. Okay, <laughs> So, hey, tell, tell us, Wayne, how does your program work? You have a, a couple of different programs within mm -hmm. your organization. I, I want to hear about both of them. Sure. Yeah. One is we work with um, adult felony offenders in the prison system. Here in California, um, we're on uh, six California prison yards. <clears throat> we have another four that um, our funding just expired and we've got to find a new source of funding, um, which, which we will, we'll, we'll find it. 
but uh, we've maintained a presence in the CDCR, California Department of uh, Corrections and Rehabilitation for um, 14 years now. Um, nationwide, our instruments and programs are in over 260 American correctional facilities. Uh, we have programs uh, on Rikers Island in New York. We have programs in the Cook County Jail in Chicago, in the Michigan Department of Corrections, um, Florida, uh, Colorado, Arizona, more than I can remember. Um, often what we do is simply provide instruments. Uh, facilities will have their own programs, mm -hmm. um, but the, the, don't have the guitars. Yeah. Uh, we use cajones, a beatbox to create beats. We can provide keyboards for some places, drum kits. Um, so we, we can provide them the tools to begin a music program. Um, and we also um, have written and uh, execute programs in the facilities. Um, they, they're done through a workshop format. It's a songwriting workshop. The focus of what we're doing is trying to, to help people find a way to communicate complex, often painful feelings, memories um, in a positive way, in a, in a way that um, adds some fun and some beauty to the world through writing a song about it. Um, I found that uh, if a person can articulate their experience in the song, you know, can they tell me their story or a part of their story in a song? Mm -hmm. It changes them on a fundamental level. Yeah. Education is important. Here in California, uh, roughly 50% of the prison population are illiterate. It's hard enough to find a job out here when you can read and write. Um, so education is crucial. But if you just educate a criminal, you've ended up with an educated criminal. You have to change, you have to reach people on a deeper, more basic level of how do they see themselves? Do I see myself as a, as a gangster? Do I see myself as a tough guy? Do I see myself as a, a failure, a loser? As the story, as their story. Yeah. Do they see themselves as their story and is there another story that is still. not being yeah because yeah. that's how our brains work we Correct. tell ourselves stories right. and, and we believe them and, yeah. and then we act on them so if we can start a new narrative a new idea a new self-image to see yourself as more than a, a prison number or what happened on the worst day of your life um that maybe um you could you could um, contribute something. So in the process of the workshops, we um, will not allow gang affiliations, racial barriers, sexual preference barriers, class. Um, we require people to understand that we are going to treat each other with dignity and respect. And that in this room, we are all artists. And prison politics stay out on the yard. And it creates a great atmosphere of collaboration, of which collaboration. is what music is about. Yeah, not only does that happen on the outside, on the inside, but on the outside too. When we Absolutely. look at music and the the great collaborations between yeah. genres, between cultures, between yep. Americans, you know, it's just and it amazing. brings us all together, does, right? Yeah. You forget your yeah. color, your sexual preference. When music comes on, it doesn't matter what that is. That's right. You know, I've got a, um, I work in Rwanda in this, uh, for an organization called Rwanda Watsa. We opened the first music school in a country devastated by genocide 20 years ago. Yeah. And I work with kids and we do basically the same thing you do. Mm -hmm. So when that, that idea came to me, it hit me immediately. Somebody brought it to me and I was, it was just like, we do the same thing with these kids. Yeah. They have a story. And we've got one in a, in a refugee camp up on the border of the Congo, the UN refugee camp, and we're the first music school there. But 
they are like like prisoners there. They can't leave. And it's the same thing. We're, we're helping them tell their story in a different way. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's it's about connection. Yeah. It's about one human being connecting with another. It's just, you know, it, if I can see my own humanity, then that helps me see your humanity. Right. That we're not our differences, that our our similarities are way larger and more powerful and more beneficial to us. Yeah. You know, if I can get a, a guy from Compton to write a song with a guy from Royal Heights, who have traditionally uh, been enemies yeah. and they work together on a song um they they they've lowered those barriers they've lowered those those boundaries of uh, the in group out group and all this is to de is designed to prepare people for returning to the so-called free world yeah the community that's right most it's, people in prison are are coming home someday. it's huge uh as i'm finding out because we've got a couple few clients i've got one in particular that's coming out into a world he's been in 25 years so we'll, he knows nothing so about change it's devastating and yeah. and maybe you can maybe you can talk about our services yeah. with what we've done with folks. And I, yeah. You know, yeah. To hear about that. Yeah. So hired power is, you know, founded around transitional services. So we're not therapy. Uh, we're not a treatment program, but we can provide those connecting services, right? Bridging the gap, getting back into community. So where do you bridge that gap and what does that look like? So more recently, um, we've been doing more work with people who are either incarceration um, or facing incarceration, they are currently incarcerated, or we're looking at, okay, alternative sentencing. So they're sitting in front of whoever that is, that legal system to say, here's what you've done, and now here's what's gonna happen um, for sentencing. And so Nanette Zumwalt, our CEO, is able to write alternative sentencing letters. And so she can get on and write these letters to hopefully say, okay, the client is going to go um, start a monitoring program. So we have that monitoring program and we work within the legal confines of this is what they're, they're here for. This is what the testing requirements are. This is who we report to. One positive test results in, you know, they return to jail or they get X, Y, Z done. Um, we also do pieces where we say, we're going to pick up the client from the courthouse in New York, and we're going to fly them to LA where the crime occurred, they're going to get their ankle bracelet, and we're going to return them to this treatment facility, and they'll begin their treatment stay there. Um, and that we call a safe passage. And so we're able to get in and support the client that way, but we're also able to do case management services, which is a little bit of what Harold does and Annette and Poppy, but Harold does, and he's working right now with someone who is incarcerated, has been incarcerated for 25 years. So if anybody can just talk about technology changes in 25 years and the cost of living, um, let's just say he's gonna be stumped. And so Harold is able to reach out to the parole, write out letters of saying, this is what we're going to be working on. I've looked at anger management groups or programs. This is where he'll be going. Um, we'll have a staff with him. So we call that a PRA service. So that first I, I, I can tell you this. Yeah. He was up for the board here oh, yeah, this is so a few months ago. Right? And we did all this pre-work. I wrote letters. We had I wanted to go to Sober Living. It's been in 25 years. Nothing spot. Us, you know, yeah. record. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, we put together this program for the board. He went before the board. They didn't want to hear any of it. It was his first time. He had these hopes because they are releasing a lot of folks these mm -hmm. days. Yeah. And he thought that with his time served. Anyway, he got the night, and, and it was, uh, you know, it's so important because I was able to communicate. He was able to communicate. With me, mm -hmm. his feelings and frustration, yeah, and anger, and but he managed to transcend that, and I, I found that uh, it was so profound because the, he was in for murder case, mm -hmm. and his anger is always he was such an emotional guy, but he he has uh, done a lot of work in there, 
And you he's know, changed. He's changed. Yeah, he's changed. Um, can I ask you what, what, it's, what for people who never on this uh, webinar who don't understand what it's like being in that environment? Can you walk us through what's it like showing up? You know, when you when you're doing your work, what is that? Well, for, for for me, returning to correctional facilities and doing the work we do um, is always uh, a life affirming, um, positive experience. Um, the energy of the students in our workshops. So it's not traumatic to you. Not anymore. Not anymore. It, it was a little weird when I first started returning to prisons. In fact, uh, me and my wife would have a fight every time I was getting ready to go back, mm -hmm. whatever it was. We're not doing this right. We're not doing that right. This is wrong. That's wrong. Don't do this. Do that. I guess I was a little wired up. She's nodding her head over there. Um, but I'm, pr I'm pretty uh, relaxed with it today. Today, it's it's a, a great experience and, and a great opportunity to, to be of service to um, people that the that the that our society has thrown away, people that uh, they don't they want you to just don't bother me, go over there somewhere, let someone else deal with it. Um, and you know we're talking about human beings. You know we're not talking about our pets. We're talking about human beings and. The damage done by the, the prison experience is profound. Um, it's, I don't know anyone that served a prison term that does not suffer from some degree of PTSD. Um, there's just a, a kind of, you know, the, the facilities themselves, uh, by their very nature, are filled with some dangerous people, uh, people who have severe mental um, and emotional challenges, mm -hmm. who are, for the most part, untreated, uh, and a culture that um, could hardly be described as positive. It, it's, it's really... Uh, it, it, so... Begs the question, what were they thinking? Yeah, right. You know, it's, it's really, it's a medieval yeah. concept. You know, I mean, they thought that they were improving things with the penitentiary system when they, uh, when America was founded, um, things haven't improved that much. Um, so I think, I think the, the focus is on programming. You know, we have a golden opportunity with people uh, under, in custody that, we can help them. And my experience is most people want help. Most people want to figure out what went wrong. Most people don't want to be in prison. They want to go home. And, and they're ripe for some new information coming into the picture. Um, uh, the, the other aspect of what we do is, of course, with young people. Yes. Um, here, where we're, we are now at the Capo Center, Community Arts Programming and Outreach. This is an amazing center, by the way. I, I was blown away the first time I, I came here because it's from so, Salt. This is prime LA real estate. You, you have to understand, we're in the middle of Fairfax District. Uh, there's a couple of studios from maybe quarter of a mile from here, prime real estate. And, uh, and when I walked through the doors, I just got this amazing sense of, wow. How did you how did you put this together? How did this how did this part come into being? You know, you you get you've got the incarcerated older guys, yeah. and now I walked into a room of, of of young people in doing various music oriented things. Well, well, about um, seven eight years ago, we started working in the Los Angeles County probation camps and juvenile halls, and. and uh, the programs were very successful. The young people, you know, they all want to be rap stars and they all got a rap and they all got a story. And so we started working with them and, and building relationships, building trust. You know, these are these are young people for whom adults have always let them down, who have never done what they said they were going to do, never show up when they say they're going to show up. And we try to illustrate that, you know, some of us care enough to show up when we say we're going to show up. 
and we started running our programs and it quickly became clear to me that um, if we didn't have something for these young people when they were released from custody, they would just go back to banging. They'd go Is back that to the neighborhood yeah. and, the, and they're right back. And then they're going to catch another case and they'll be back. And we've seen it over and over. Kids get released and six months later, they're back in again. And this is the, you know, this is the cradle to prison pipeline. This right. is a real thing. Well, and I think it's also around the family dynamic, right? Yeah. So the sick family, if the family doesn't get better, right? And nobody gets nobody better. Gets better. Yeah. And we work around that with where what we do as well is, yeah. you know, a lot of that case management support that we give is for the family yeah. to help the family get better so that when the person is coming out of treatment, coming out of, you know, incarceration, we are changing that dynamic for them to make it a healthier environment that yeah. they're going back to. That's that's why, so we said, you know, we need to build a place where we can continue the work we did inside, out here. So all the kids here, all your clients, have they been in juvenile detention or are all of them, them most are system involved? Yeah. Okay, but not all, correct? Not all. Okay, so that's not a criteria for getting that's, yeah. that's what I wanted to ask. Yeah, non, non justice system uh, involved kids are certainly welcome. You know, we're working upstream. Yeah, I know. You know. If I can get a kid to change direction one degree, he can find something besides banging that he's interested in, that she's interested, that she cares about. Um, she might, she or he might avoid spending their adult life in the California Department of Corrections. Now, I don't have to give them a guitar later at San Quentin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we talk about this population as at risk, yeah. you, which, you know, it's been watered down. What does that mean? Yeah. yeah. But I was here a couple of weeks ago. It's a misnomer. And I was here um, maybe a month or two ago, and then something happened with one of your kids. And yeah. it was traumatizing, uh, you know, to, to. We lost a boy, a boy died. One of our just really shining light in the program, one of our most enthusiastic, talented young man. And uh, we, I, I suspect it was a fentanyl overdose. We know that he was yeah. using uh, infrequently, experimenting like young people do. But this fentanyl is so lethal yeah. that you don't know what you're getting. Every and, time. You know, they can say that. this is a Percocet. We deal with it all the time. Yeah. 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 We it's see that terrible. so much. It's so terrible. Anytime you're getting drugs off the street right now, you just need to think this could have fentanyl in it. Yeah. This could be the last time I ever breathe again. Yes. And it is so dangerous and so scary. And people yeah. are treating it like, it's not an important part of life. Like, but it's like bought Xanax. Right. Off where? From the street? Then you don't know that it's all amazing. That's right. But it was a reality check. Yeah. And, and it, it hit, hit us and it hit all the young people really hard. I mean, you know, it was, it was the, the harshest form of reality that, that we can face um, and made everybody. Uh, think and feel and uh you know and and did it bring them closer together yeah it, no it, it absolutely got us closer together um you know we were able to talk about it in in group yeah. and and be able to process these feelings in a new way yeah. in a healthy way um or healthier way um and so we try to learn from the medium and try to make it a teachable moment if we can. But we're, you know, we're just, we're very excited about the Capo Center and, and uh, we, we've got, we've got a lot of program. We also uh, are able to hire uh, returned citizens to work here with us. Um, so we work in uh, re-entry and uh, a lot of the same kinds of things that you guys do. Um, to help people ease that transition from institution life to living out here, because it's, a, it's just a staggering change, you know, to meet men who have been in prison for decades, 
who, who in prison, they were somebody. They were leaders. They were respected elders who, who people came to for counsel and advice. At, and they come, they get out, and they're just a dude on the corner. They're nobody. And in a world that's technology right. that is uh, just, it's like when I live in the Middle Ages to, to you know, yeah. in the last, just thinking of the last 20 years, what's going on in the last year? Yeah. There's so many different ways. It, it would seem frightening to me. I think, I think the, the Titanic is slowly turning. I think there's a, a, a consciousness emerging um, where uh, the political leaders are starting to realize that this is a community, this is a population that we have to account for. Right. You know, that there has to be paths to housing, paths to healthcare, paths to employment, right. paths to education. I mean, we're talking about millions of Americans, millions. And, um, and you know, my experience has been, this is a, a prize workforce. These are people who know things that nobody else knows. And these are people that are perfectly positioned to help others who are coming back out of the system. I mean, if you've been in prison, you know what I'm talking about. Let me ask you something, Kate just came here. In your work, have you run across any real, really talented people that you maybe would like to mentor when they get out? Or have, have you seen, have you, I mean, you, there's something about solitude. Uh, I think we saw this during the pandemic and creativity. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes you, when you're isolated, you, some of the greatest works of fiction, some of the greatest, think of Nelson Mandela in particular, but have you, have you, have you seen any uh, real talent? Dozens, yeah. dozens. I've met dozens of, of men and women that, uh, that, you know, I am humbled yeah. that I wish I'd written some of those lyrics. Yeah. I mean, some of the music has been just unbelievable. Yeah. Just really profoundly talented people. Um, yeah, over and over. Yeah. Some people, they didn't even know they were talented until they started trying to write songs and they realized they had a way with words and they could put an idea together. They could be honest and a lot of great hip hop stuff too. I mean, you know, it's, oh, okay. it's across the board. Yeah. It's across the board. I, I, I've had guys that, you know, have written songs about sailing, <laughs> you know, and they're great songs. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you just can't deny it. And I think that that um, encouraging people's creativity is the key that unlocks all the doors, you know, it, it, because we all have to be creative to some degree just to survive in the world. You've got to figure out what's going to work, what isn't going to work, make the right decision, move in a certain direction. Um, and, and I think that's an acquired skill. Maybe some of us have it intuitively, maybe some of us learned it when we were children, but it's a skill that we all have to have to, to get along in the world. And it all translates, you know, the creative process of writing a song, mm -hmm. um, of acting in a play, of writing a short story. That same creative process will help you um, in, in the, you know, almost impossible task of, of returning to, to freedom uh, after, you know, we lock people up for so long in this country, it, it, too long. I, I would go so far as to say even a, a violent offenders, it's too much time. It's too much. If you look around the world at other prison systems that are way more successful than ours, um, they temper the sentences um, uh, to... to to be more appropriate, less inappropriate. You know, to lock somebody up for for 25 years um, who made a terrible mistake when they were a teenager, it's unconscionable. Uh, but it, it's what we do, and and uh, you know, this is this is a an ongoing battle. That's right. I think we'll be facing it for for years to come. I don't expect to see it in my lifetime. To see it resolve, and and the challenges for families too yeah. about again navigating the system. Yeah, navigating what, the system, what that looks like. Um, I would say too, a big piece of it is is if the 
the the person who's incarcerated isn't given the tools to implement change when they get out, mm -hmm. then then you've not done anything to fill their toolbox and you've not done anything to really set them up for success. Mm -hmm. And so it I mean, as you tell your story, my mind goes to addiction and mental health as well, right? So it before treatment was big, we used to criminalize the addict mm -hmm. and the mental health. And mm -hmm. we would, I mean, you have to think, even the loony then, right? So people used to go get put, you know, cuckoo's nest, one flew over a cuckoo's nest, or all these old behavioral health, but psychiatric mm -hmm. loony bin movies that went around. These these people lived in psych hospitals. Yeah. They didn't get out. It wasn't like a you're you're mentally ill and now you can get medication and get stabilized and get out and but keep you know keep coming back and doing your work same with this and so we're in addiction we do acts of service so you get you get you get sober you're in recovery you give back mm -hmm. you know i see in yes and so let's say in arizona my brother who was in prison and got out of prison in arizona don't go to prison in arizona they have like really stringent stuff, but it's awesome. So when he got out, he had community service hours. He had to give back. Mm -hmm. He had to go into a sober living facility because he also was- They made that part of his That's condition. part of his conditions. He had to talk with his parole officer, check in. He had to get a get well job. Mm -hmm. Same as in the addiction and recovery. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, and I hope that, where we were when I first went into the field of addiction and mental health at 16 years old. And even though I grew up in it, right, with a mom who was an addict, I believe that with enough attention being brought to the incarcerated population, mm -hmm. to the cost, right? Because mm -hmm. everything comes down to the bottom dollar, the cost of what it takes to incarcerate one human being, mm -hmm. and we have a lot. Um, we'll look at what can we do as alternative sentencing? What can we do to decriminalize the, the non-violent offender? Because how many of them are in there for non-violent crimes that could be giving back, doing community well, service? And I think we're beginning to see that. Yeah, yeah. It's this, this becomes a public safety yeah, issue. It does. You know, we're all it's interested in, in living in safe communities and being able to walk the streets and not have people break in and steal our TV. And, um, the, so the, the, you know, listen. I as as a returned citizen, as a convicted felon, I believe in the rule of law. I think we need the rule of law. I think we need the police. Yeah. Um, who are you going to call? It? You know, somebody's they coming into your house. Right. Um, um, so if, if we have this opportunity to make the world safer by working with this population, by helping them find solutions for the challenges they face. Because if we don't, um, they will just get worse. The, the prison experience um, hasn't improved anyone. It didn't improve me, uh, and I don't think it improves anybody else. So some extra effort has to go into changing the direction uh, of, of our thinking about incarceration and then uh, as it shows up in legislation and funding for programs, because the key to all this is to have positive programming that people can um, participate in over the course of their sentence um, to make the positive changes necessary to rejoin us in the world and be a, an asset. You know, you're going to stand in line next to an offender at the supermarket. You're going to sit in a movie theater next to an offender, you know, who, and who do you want next to well, you? Well, I brought the to her a shirt, and she, the first, and she loved it. I mean, this is how this, this conversation, this is how this conversation came to be. Yeah. I gave her a shirt, and what, what? I put it on, and I wore it to go get lunch at the grocery store. And I asked for a Caesar salad, and the gentleman had his arm in the, the place getting me the Caesar salad and he had two sleeves worth of instruments tattooed on his arms. And he looks up at me and he goes, jailhouse get you or jail to it's hard to say. I am not know to get to I apologize. Yeah, this is what it is. And he goes, Oh my gosh, music saved my life in there. And every instrument I learned to play is tattooed 
on my arm. And let me tell you, he had more musical instruments on his arm than I kind of even knew really existed in, in life. But that's, that was his saving grace was the music that yeah. he was able to learn while he was incarcerated. And then here he was now, you know, working in the working world and working at a grocery store. Yeah. And the people we work with love the, the classes. They love the workshops. They, they've told me, you know, I, I, I just exist till next week's and, and I want to I want to thank you for employing some of my friends who've been out of work for a long time since the pandemic. It hit the music industry so hard, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. you've employed a, a few of my friends uh, to, to go and do that work. So you know, I, I think um, listen, our, our time is getting close, but okay. um, I, I was wondering, Emily, if we had any questions out there. I don't know if we're doing chats. Yes. Or... yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Perfect timing. So we do have a question here, and this is a good time to remind everyone else that's listening. This is, feel free to use the Q&A feature and ask anything else. You have this amazing panel here. All right, here's the first question. Do you have any tips for family or friends helping loved ones transition back into their community after incarceration? Yeah, um, get a case manager so that you don't have to do it alone. It can be so lonely. It can be so frustrating. Um, I can tell you just trying to support my own brother and I know this field, right? I live and breathe this field, but I didn't live and breathe the field of incarceration and that population. And so, you know, trying to connect with, okay, did they go in and they have substances and they need to live a life of recovery? Okay, do I need to get them support services to go to a sober living? Yeah. Do I need to do some monitoring type of program? Should I have some staff go home with them and help support them in the transition? So think this 25 plus person who's been incarcerated is going to come out to a whole new world. And so my tip is always going to be one, use the resources, know what's out there for you. Um, there are so many things. It's just you have to know what you're looking for. You can't just Google it, unfortunately. Um, it won't really point you in the right direction. And so having a trained professional help support the family um, while that person is coming out, mm -hmm. because then we can wrap our hands around all of the services that they may need to, success to successfully set them up for reintegration into community. So it's, but you know, from my standpoint, that's a great question, by the way. It seems that there are, correct me if I'm wrong, a poverty resources for people coming out. So can afford mm -hmm. uh, case management services with a, with a company like ours, but many can't. Do you, are, Wayne, do you know of any of that uh, kind of Management. Yeah, the, the Flintridge Center in Pasadena yeah. uh, offers a full range of uh, services for uh, returning citizens. That's great. Uh, medical care, yeah. transportation, yeah. food, housing. I mean, these are, you know, most people wouldn't be in a position to ever contemplate the challenge yeah. of coming from an institution where everything is done for you. You yeah. show up at the chow hall and there's your food. You go to the laundry and you get your clothes. Maybe you have a job to do every day. You got your friends and, and you have one overriding concern and that's going home. Yes. One big thing is to be free again. And then you get free and you realize, wow, there's a lot of stuff I have to deal with. You know, how am I going to get to the Flint Ridge Center? How am I going to get to the Capo Center? Yeah. How am I going to get to you guys? Right. You know, starting with transportation. You know, people come out, um, they have to find a ID. It's a big issue. You know, they might have been down 20 years, 30 years. You got to start over at zero. I, I have a dear friend who came out after 28 years. And he wanted to go to Kmart because he needed some things. He was living in a transitional housing. Mm -hmm. And so he stood in the line and uh, the checkout young man says, uh, do you, uh, you have a Kmart card? I mean, a Walmart card, what was a Target? Do you have a Target card? And he said, no, what's that? And he said, oh, it's a credit card. You know, if you don't have one, I can get you one. And my friend said, sure, great, let's do that. And he said, uh, can I see your driver's license? 
license. I don't have a driver's license. You don't have a driver's license? He said, no, oh, man, I, I just got out of prison. I've been down 28 years. And the kids, okay, you want to pay cash then? Yeah. <laughs> but that, yeah, that was how, how out of sync a person can be when they when they come home. Yeah. So these kinds of services are essential. And it was like that too with the mental health system when when we had the big Camarillo, the big, the big uh, mental health facilities, psychiatric facilities. Before yeah. Reagan. Before, exactly. And they just opened the doors. Yeah. And this whole population, you know, especially in California, came out and they had the same, yeah. quite the same issues. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. That was a great answer. But um... you also be patient with them. They're going to, they're going to, it's, they're, they're like, you know, a brother from another planet. Yeah. I mean, so you got to be patient with people there and they're going to make mistakes. You just want to stay, keep them close and, and uh, let them know that, you know, they got support. Great. Well, that's similar to this next question. So can you help with any ideas or resources for family members watching loved ones that seem to be headed towards incarceration? Oh, I mean, that would be kind of... So I would start by saying, if they're hooked up in their school system, engage a school system, um, you know, watching, being able to keep track of some of those things. But I think it's also getting them involved in community programs, kind of like what you have here, right? So before they become incarcerated and or put into the juvenile detention centers, how do we get them connected to community um, to figure out why do they, why are they choosing that pathway? Um, yeah, and there's reasons for the, you know, why are they, why are they going down the tubes and, yeah. and headed towards that? Uh, for me, uh, you know, if uh, as, a, as a recovering drug addict for many years when I was a kid, um, I went instead of going to jail, I went to long-term treatment. But uh, many times it's drug and alcohol involved, and, and there are so many resources. And that, and it really comes back to mentoring. Uh, you know, us mentoring. You do it. I, I know you do. I, I certainly do. We, we kind of see these folks who are struggling, these kids who are struggling, and we become mentors to them because sharing our personal stories is powerful, and they hear that. So I, I really would suggest finding someone in your orbit that this person can respect and listen to. Yeah, yeah. If they can find one person, one person. That, that they admire, that they yeah. aspire to be like, and try to try to make a connection with that person, that, that can go a long way, a long way. Yeah, like I did with you. Exactly. That's great. That's great so much. So, all right. Well, as we wrap up here, I mean, is can you guys maybe just help give what is what is the first step what should someone do you guys gave a lot of great information and resources today but what's the first step someone could actually do today i think i think the first step is caring you know and and talking everything begins with a conversation to to you know talk about this with people with your friends with your family you know this this is a, a a condition that's not going away, yeah. uh, not not in our lifetime. Um, so start with that conversation. You know, what do you really know about um, people that end up uh, in the system? What what do you really know about what their options are, uh, and what can you do? Educate, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, volunteer uh, work is the best. If, if you have a few hours a week and you can volunteer at an organization, um, you'll learn a lot. You'll learn a lot. It'll be the, it'll be the most rewarding experience of your life. You can't buy it with money. Mm -hmm. You have to care. And if you care, you can make a difference. That's a great um, idea, especially as we I, get closer to Thanksgiving right now. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I think that another piece is some people feel like helpless and hopeless. Mm -hmm. um, they don't know the way out of it, right? And so reaching out and saying, hey, how can you help? If you know somebody who's been through it, how can you help? If you don't know somebody who's been through it, 
call a professional company and say, hey, I'm looking at this, or my loved one is looking at facing this time. I know you guys do alternative sentencing, or I know that you do work with, you know, this population. Like, how can you support me? What resources are there for me? Because I can tell you, doing this with my brother, I still felt hopeless, helpless sometimes. Like writing, writing character letters and what should be included in a character letter and what don't I want to write in the character letter and how do I get a hold? What's the best time to call a public defense attorney and should I actually go to his court case or should I have just send my letters in? I think it is so nice. Luckily, Nanette Zumwalt is my my you know adopted mother and so uh, I have her to turn to for a lot of that professional advice. Otherwise, I'd hire higher power myself, but. I get to, for someone who doesn't have that resource like her, I wouldn't have known that. And it would have been detrimental. And some people then give up. And then your loved one's not getting any letters. Your loved one's not getting any cards. Your loved one isn't getting a character letter because you don't know how to do that. And one last thing, because Wayne said it too, finding a creative outlet for yeah. the people that you see are in the wrong way, writing, be it whatever, get, get them engaged. You know, music is a... Great vehicle for that. You can a lot. you can uh, you can you can join us at jailguitardoors.org, and uh, we'll give you a host of options. Um, if you want to uh, help support us, we certainly would gratefully accept any uh, cash donations. Um, you know, funding these kinds of nonprofit organizations is a constant challenge, and uh, so. It, if you can, then you know, send us uh, some twos and fews. If you happen to be a hedge fund manager and you want to send us 100,000, we would accept it with gratitude. I love it, Wayne. You got to ask. So yeah. thank you so much. This has been an incredible conversation. I hope it was enlightening and educational for everyone that tuned in. Um, this will be going on YouTube. So I really hope that we can reach more people and provide hope and help. And, you know, of course, um, we will include the link to be to reach out to Wayne Kramer and his organization. And also, of course, Harold, Deidre, and the entire team at Hired Power is always available. We answer calls 24 hours a day, 360 days a year. So you can call us anytime. We know that things get crazy, especially around the holidays and we are here for you. Yeah, and I, and I wanna really thank you guys. And Wayne, I've always, Wayne, I've always, you guys looked up to him as a mentor because he's an incredible human being. And, uh, you know, I, I, I get better when I'm with my brother here. There you go. Works both ways. There you go. Thank you, well, both. Awesome. Thank you. Huh? I said I'm just the energy that pulls it together for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's great. Love well, thank thank you. you so much to our speakers. Thank you to the attendees for joining, and we look forward to hearing from you all soon. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye.